Hello and welcome everybody. Thanks for joining me for today's live stream with a, maybe a little unusual topic. Um, today we're going to talk about how cannabis can be an economic driver for Jamaica and maybe become yeah, an important economic industry for the whole Caribbean. I'm very happy to have two um, yeah, high quality guests today um, that are way more yeah, experts uh, in the field um, than I am. And therefore, yeah, I'm looking forward to this conversation today. As always, um, let me know if you can see and hear me loud and clear. Feel free to use the chat function, um, yeah, use the thumbs up, the like button and so on. I will introduce the speakers and the guests in a minute. But before I do that, um, I want to make sure um, yeah, that everybody is on the same page when we're talking about um, cannabis. Therefore, I want to give a short introduction. I want to keep it under five minutes um, yeah, about the history of cannabis and maybe answer the question why we have that um, yeah, regulatory environment that we are having today, to put it mildly. So I think, um, yeah, it's probably a good idea to start a little bit um, back. So I, I think big it up a little. So history of cannabis. Um, yeah, it's probably fair to say that cannabis is one of the you know, oldest uh, plants that humans are using when we look at um, yeah, the history of uh, the usage by humans, then it dates back to at least the third millennium BC when we look at written history and when we look at archaeological um, evidence, then we talk about yeah, a few thousand years more than that. And um, of course, it's probably one of the most useful plants that we have out there today for millennia. It was used um, yeah, for its fiber, for its rope, food, medicine, psychoactive compounds, religious use, the creational use and so on. And um, yeah, when we look at its origins, it's somewhere, you yeah, know, came up the first time in uh, the Asian continent. Um, then it spread out yeah, to Europe, Africa, and then in the 1600s um, to the Americas. And I think um, we will hear more about the different species and hybrids and so on. Um, today and yeah for a few thousand years that went pretty fine with the plant so far um, and humanity benefited from um, yeah the properties and then the 20 centuries happened and uh, yeah things went a little bit sideways not only on the geopolitical scene but also when we talk about um, prohibition or in that case um, cannabis prohibition um, so then the question become okay why became cannabis legal and its users criminalized. And um, that was too fast. There are, in my opinion, two reasons. Um, the first reason um, are economic and financial interests. And I want to encourage you, if you're interested in that, to dive deeper into that. But um, generally speaking, hemp or cannabis is a direct competitor for a lot of industries back in the day and today we talk about cotton oil paper clothing fiber farmer and so on and i think we will talk about a lot more use cases in the future or in today's conversation um, for example when we look at today's pharma industry um, yeah the global pain management drug market was around 70 billion in 2020 and um, yeah research indicates that 80 percent of pain medication could be replaced with cannabis meaning a plant that you can grow on your balcony. You see the research paper down below. And uh, therefore, you could argue that there are certain interest groups that might not be so interested in yeah, the use of cannabis as a readily available plant for everybody. But back um, yeah, at the beginning of the 20th century, 1925, the League of Nations signs the Opium Convention for the first time adding pure cannabis, amongst other drugs, under international control. One of the major advocates here was Egypt, which was also one of the biggest cotton producers at the time. And as I said, cannabis or hemp 
is a big competitor in that industry. Then 1937, the United States passed the Mariana Tax Act and basically are yeah, prohibiting all the use of cannabis on a federal level. Again, we saw paper industry, fuel industry, textile industry, and the um, yeah, financial interests of companies like DuPont or the Bank of Mellon. And you should remember these names because, um, yeah, a few years later, you should know that guy, um, Mr. Anslinger, was appointed the founding commissioner of the Treasury's Federal Bureau of Narcotics by the department secretary, Andrew E. W. Mellon, who was his wife's uncle. So we have nepotism at its finest here. And that brings me to the second reason um, why I think yeah, cannabis um, became criminalized um, was social control and racism. Because in the 1930s, Anslinger's anti Mariana, Mariana articles um, often contained racist themes and so much so that even yeah, conservative politicians at one point called for Anslinger to resign based on his open racist remarks. And you can see one of his quotes um, on the screen here. I think I don't have to repeat that. But um, yeah, if in the 1930s your conservative friends call you a little bit too racist, I think uh, yeah, you really have to earn that. So um, then he testified um, in front of the US Congress when we talked about the Mariana Tax Act, and he said, quote, Mariana is the most violence causing drug in the history of mankind. Most Mariana smokers are Negroes, Hispanics, Filipinos, and entertainers. Their satanic music, jazz, and swing results from Mariana usage. This Mariana causes white women to seek sexual relations with Negroes. Yeah, I think we don't have to say more here. And, um, yeah, I would say um, similar reasons um, happened 1930 in Jamaica when uh, the Ganja law was passed, uh, which was primarily supported by the white ruling class and the Council of the Evangelical Churches in Jamaica at that time. Then fast forward, 1970, the United States passed the Controlled Substance Act and uh, yeah, basically replacing the act from 1937. And that's what we now or today know with, as Nixon's war on drugs. And um, yeah, I want to quote one of, one of his advisors at that time, why they, well, when he was asked for the reason for the war on drugs. You want to know, and I quote, you want to know what this was really all about. He asked with the bluntness of a man who, after public disgrace and the stretch in federal prison, had little left to protect. The Nixon campaign in 1968 and the Nixon White House after that had two enemies, the anti-war left and black people. You understand what I'm saying? We knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or black, but by getting the public to associate the hippies with Mariana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disrupt those communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, and vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? Of course we did. Yeah, then we see how the arrest statistics um, yeah, skyrocket over the next decades, um, of course, especially in the US, and that policy kind of spilled over and basically the rest of the world. And um, yeah, that's where we are today. So what's the current state? of affairs. Um, in Jamaica 2015, um, Jamaica decriminalized the possession of up to two ounces of cannabis and legalized the cultivation for personal use of up to five plants. A little later, Germany, where I'm from, in 2017, um, yeah, Germany legalized medical cannabis and in 2021, under the new German coalition, they announced plans for recreational legalization. And as we speak, they um, yeah, are in their consulting sessions and to talk about how they're actually going to implement that. So yeah, I'm looking forward to see how this is going to play out. So today, legal medical cannabis, as you can see here, um, blue means completely legal, green means legal for medical use. And um, then for recreation, recreational use, um, everything that is red, of course, is highly criminalized. Uh, yeah, orange and, and yellow areas are yeah, kind of decriminalized and blue is legal. So what are the goals, not only for today's talk, but um, in general, um, I think, yeah, 
globally, number one um, should be the goal to decriminalize and legalize um, cannabis in every country. No human should be criminalized, dehumanized, punished, thrown in jail for the possession or use of a plant, in that case, cannabis. Um, and of course, what we will talk a little bit more in detail today, um, a policy and a legal framework for a legal cannabis industry. Yeah. I said that earlier, I think the one drugs is probably one of the longest ongoing human rights violations of our time. And I think it's time to change that for the better. And that brings me to today's guests. Um, let me remove, uh, remove my presentation here. Yeah, welcome the one Flynn, chairman of the Cannabis Licensing Authority of Jamaica. And Marcel Emmanuel, probably one of the most yeah, known researchers in the cannabis field in the Caribbean. I'm very happy to have you guys here. And um, yeah, let's talk a little bit about how we can yeah, use that plant um, to help the Caribbean, help Jamaica. And uh, yeah, let's take it from there. Uh, thank you, Simon. Yeah, man. Thank you, Simon. Uh, we have, yeah. um, I cannot hear you, Marcel. Marcel. Yeah, good morning, Mr. Omari Jackson. Great to have you. Um, if you have any questions for the speakers, um, yeah, feel free to use the chat function. I will bring up all the comments, all the questions um, as I see them and as I see fit. So, um, yeah, just want to make sure, can you hear me, guys? Is the tech working so far? Can you hear me clearly? All right, perfect. Yeah, looks, okay. looks right. great. Can you hear you? Great. All right. Um, so yeah, maybe you want to start with uh, introducing yourself so that people know you uh, or know who you are and maybe a little, know a little bit about your background. Okay, I'll, I'll start. Um, thanks again, Simon, for the invitation and thanks for having us and thanks for the interest in Jamaica's burgeoning medical cannabis industry. Um, so Levon Flynn, Chairman of the Cannabis Licensing Authority of Jamaica. I've been the chairman since February 2021, and I consider myself a, a liberal cannabis regulator, meaning that when you think of cannabis regulations or a regulating body, oftentimes it's just think as just that, just a body that regulates. But I'm of the view that regulation alone will never, ever grow an industry. Uh, it will simply maintain it. So one of the things that the board has been doing on, on my, under my leadership over the past year and a half in Jamaica is crafting a wider vision for the Jamaican cannabis industry. What do we want from the industry? What do we want the industry to look like? What are the benefits we want to achieve from the, from the industry? So we've been very much focused on that and looking at the operational elements uh, that we need to move, to move the industry forward. Um, and working very closely with persons like Dr. Emmanuel, um, some of the local farming groups, some of the other ministries and agencies that are part of the Jamaican cannabis industry. We have a goal and a vision of what we want to achieve, and now it's going through the process of getting it done. All right. Uh, thanks for that, Lebon. Yeah, so my name is Marshall. Emmanuel, I'm a horticulturalist. I'm a lecturer at the University of the West Indies Department of Life Sciences. I am the principal investigator for the Life Science Cannabis Research Group, where we conduct research based on understanding quality assurance, maintaining public health and safety throughout the value chain and how we explore the commercial production of cannabis from a commercial perspective. Uh, I'm, I'm the vice chairman for the cannabis for the cannabis technical committee, the Bureau of Standards Jamaica. I'm also a member of the cannabis industry task force that sits within the Ministry of Industry and in Commerce. I also chair the sub the subcommittee for product for product development. Uh, I conduct research on various aspects of the cannabis plant from entomology 
to plant diagnostics, to plant pathology, to just understanding basic plant husbandry techniques for cultivating cannabis to exploit commercially and uh, medically. Uh, the Caribbean region, as we know, is no stranger to agricultural commodities in terms of production from sugarcane to banana to rice to ornamental flowers. And now Jamaica, well, the Caribbean region has been known for, for being associated with, you know, the like cannabis plant. Uh, and it has been popularized through reggae music, through Rastafari culture, and, you know, lifestyle. So within, within, within that context, we see that first world countries have definitely decriminalized or relaxed legislation due to medical due to medical persuasions within the developing world it has been slightly different where restorative justice not criminalizing and penalizing persons for a, a small enough you know, quantities and use of you know, cannabis but 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 yet we are left with how to develop medical industries that really does not fit our socio-economic and cultural norms. Yeah, I agree here. And before we expand a little bit on that, I just want to say hi to some of the guests here now. Omari, greetings again. Good morning. And um, yeah, Vicky likes to quote a liberal cannabis regulator. I think um, that's yeah, what we up. need. Big up, Vicky. <laughs> um, yeah, so maybe uh, let, let's start there. Um, as you mentioned, um, a lot of agricultural products, sugarcane um, and so on. Uh, don't quote me on the numbers here, but I think agricultural products are around 10% of the GDP and the exports um, of uh, Jamaica, right? Now the projected market value of um, global cannabis market in 2030, meaning at like seven, eight years from now, is like 170 billion US dollars. So we're talking um, yeah, about good money here. So what is your vision, your, your yeah, current state of affairs when we talk about, okay, how can we really make sure um, that we can build an, an economic sector that actually contributes to the GDP and uh, to the economy of a Caribbean country and that we do not lose that to maybe way yeah, bigger countries or, or as you said, maybe first world countries that now just moving a little faster and yeah, maybe have yeah, to, to prevent that we're not missing out on that historical chance. That's for me, Simon. Both, both of you. <laughs> okay, I'll take a, I'll take a, you know, Simon, if if I could have things my way, if the world were mine, and I had a blank canvas in which to create a, a framework that would ensure the cannabis industry is successful in Jamaica and the Caribbean, I'd first start with the legislations we put in place how it is written, and the allowances that it, it provides. And that's important because, you know, the, the legislations is what guides the, the operations um, right. of, of, of a country and the different industries. And the regulations that we have in Jamaica now, we've come a long way, um, being one of the first countries in the region to decriminalize in 2015. Um, but we've been very slow in amending those regulations at the level that's required to match the ambitions that we have. So at a government level, we want, we see the cannabis industry as an economic enabler. We recognize the medicinal benefits of the plant. The, we, we, we're no longer attached to the lie that cannabis has no medicinal use. And we, we have a strong traditional farming sector that we'd love to include in this, um, in this industry and for them to benefit economically. Now, to achieve those three key pillars, which, which I just articulated is, articulated is actually the vision of the CLA, we need a regulatory support. And unfortunately, we have not been able to make those regulatory amendments as quickly as we'd like, but it does remain a priority. So that is a starting point for us to, to maximize on the benefits and to have the cannabis industry contributing to GDP and being able to 
address some of those restorative justices issues uh, Dr. Emmanuel alluded to. We need that strong regulatory framework, framework in place. Once we've established that regulatory framework now, you then go about uh, realizing the vision and putting the things in, in place. So for example, we want to develop the cannabis nutraceutical sector in Jamaica. Mm -hmm. For that to happen, we need closer collaboration with the Ministry of, of Health and Wellness, which sort of oversees that element of it. So once cannabis is being anything outside of the flower or the raw cannabis extract, any other cannabis product falls under the purview of the Ministry of Health and Wellness. And we've been, we've been lobbying that ministry um, for the longest while to, for us to get to a place where we can develop a cannabis nutraceutical sector where we can have different cannabis value added products. So sublinguals, uh, cannabis infused water, whatever it is, topicals, whatever it is. Um, but in order for us to do that, we need to develop the policies in place. We want to have these value added products available in pharmacies across the island. We want to have, the, have a system in place where, where a doctor can recommend um, a cannabis, cannabis product or write a prescription for a cannabis product as it is in in Germany, I believe, has that in place. I know Canada has something similar as well. Uruguay as well. I believe cannabis is distributed um, through, through, through pharmacies. So that's where we want to get to. And that's very important because if we get to that stage, we then open up the industry to the entire nation. We have almost 3 million persons. That's a good base with which to work to create a commercially viable product. And once we can do that, we can start impacting more persons uh, through the health benefits of cannabis. And then we can also start generating more revenue. We can start employing more persons. And that's, it's at that point where the government and licensees have a much better opportunity to realize those uh, economic goals thereafter. Right, so from a regional perspective, cannabis is definitely the most intra-regionally traded horticultural commodity and has the highest commercial value or the highest economic value within its raw state. So mm -hmm. cannabis has always been a mainstay within the informal economy based on villages, communities, from a traditional point of view. And we have seen where regulations has brought some a level of foreign direct investment within the region to pulmagate the uh, development of, of this sector. Uh, that, has, that has some positives and also some uh, negatives. And we see where the region is really looking to uh, create an internationally inclusive industry or trade but we need to understand that within the region we have a high or, or an abnormal level of you know, consumption patterns or I think cannabis usage within this uh, region so how do we develop our local industries to sort of encapsulate that 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 sort of value is going to be critical in terms of developing the sector from a holistic point of view we have seen right. where jamaica has exported more than 150 times to more than 10 different countries countries globally and and this is this is forthcoming information but there is still a lot more that needs to be done to encapsulate the sort of value that could be created locally based on creating the sort of inclusion from the traditional cultivators who would who would possess some indigenous knowledge in recent times we have seen where the the seizures that have been taken place from the traditional cultivators has been significantly more since the criminalization. Uh, re reasons for that, we are sort of unclear, but uh, what it's actually showing us is 
that the traditional farmers do have a level of organization within their within their sophisticated value chain to generate the sort of capacity that would be needed to facilitate international trade. We have seen where the licensees have been struggling to develop that sort of capacity based on your production. So in terms of trying to merge the indigenous knowledge, the uh, traditional cultivators with the technological advancements that the foreign direct investment has brought has brought to the shores needs to needs needs to gel a little more to be able to create the sort of employment and commerce that would be needed to inject the sort of capital that would be needed to sustain the this industry commercially mm -hmm. yeah i would agree on that and then we'll want to dive a little deeper um, into that specific area. But before I do that, um, we have a lot of uh, comments here. And to answer um, Wiki's question, um, yeah, of course, you can answer this questions, uh, can ask questions all the time. Just write out questions so that I can find it um, in the chat and then I will bring it up. And um, our guests are more than happy to answer it. And of course, we always use very diplomatic wording over here. Um, yeah, another guess, good morning. Unfortunately, we can't see your name. That's usually because you have it uh, hidden in your privacy settings. So um, yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, don't know who you are though. Um, let me see what else. Um, yeah, Vicky says, does the regulatory framework have to be excessively focused on enforcement rather than on facilitatory? Yeah, I think um, we can probably all agree on that, that we should focus more on the, yeah, setting up a regulatory framework um, rather than criminalizing people. I'd, I'd, love, um, I'd love to just touch on that question. Yeah, I'm sure. Go ahead. Great, great question, Vicky. Um, one of the things I noticed after becoming chairman is that there is a, based on the premise on which the CLA was established. It was heavily focused on being, I'll call it a regulatory hero. <laughs> so we wanted to prove to the world that given Jamaica's reputation as a, a country with wide illegal cultivation and a transshipment point for drugs, the, I believe the thinking was we wanted to prove to the world that we can have a regulated industry and, and follow the rules by the T, to the T, having no allowances, making, not allowing anything to see, to see through. And so the, the, the Cannabis Licensing Authority was really built more, like I said, as a regulator and a, as, an, as an enforcer. We've been slowly changing that culture, and that is significantly important because the team, the Cannabis Licensing Authority has a staff of about roughly about 66 persons. And the team that's there, the operational team on a day-to-day -day basis, I try to emphasize to them as much as I can how important their role is that the government, the investors, the local farmers essentially are depending on them to make the industry work. So if the team is focused more on enforcing and, 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 and policing the industry, then that leaves little room for growth. What I'd like to do is shift that around where we're facilitating, but facilitating within the requirements of the law. And, 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 and that opportunity exists, but it requires a, a particular mindset from the team. So yes, Vicky, we, are, we have realized that and we're, and we're slowly working on, on, cha on changing that culture within the authority and achieving that within the regulatory framework. Good point, Amari. We're not hearing you, Simon. I'm hearing you, Simon. You're muted. I'm so sorry. Still making beginner mistakes. Um, yeah, just wanted to say um, I see your question, Douglas, and um, also yours, Vicky. Just want to um, get back for one second um to or maybe um to you Levon, maybe you can 
expand a little bit um, on the, because as far as I understand it, there are things in place now where you're working on setting up the, the regulatory framework for the, um, for the growing uh, and the, yeah, the growing of the crop. Um, what do you see in terms of the actual available market? Meaning, let's assume I'm a farmer, I have all the licenses, I've fulfilled all my, my duties, and now I have um, some harvested crop. Now I have the problem where do I actually sell that? And um, as far as I can tell, we have two markets. We would have the domestic market in Jamaica, where I could um, export it both with its pros um, and cons. And um, I think we always have to keep in mind or to focus on, on the local market, how we can make sure that um, not only the big players at the end of the day um, yeah, benefit from, from this new industry that is growing here, but also the smaller farmer, the, the local um, population. So can you, yeah, or you both maybe um, expand a little bit on that and then I will go back to all the questions here because I see some great questions over there. Okay. so. There, there, there are two, two key things that are connected. One, the opportunities that we provide for traditional farmers, and also what I made mention earlier of being able to expand the industry. Um, because if we allow traditional farmers, if we create a system to have to include traditional farmers in the sector, and they can now cultivate ganja, um, that ganja needs to go somewhere. So we need to create that market. We need to create that demand so that there are bigger opportunities for traditional farmers to be a part of the space and that there is a demand for that raw material. Um, so as I started to mention earlier, we're developing what we call a special cultivators transitional permit. It reduced, it reduced the costs um, of the licensing fee and it reduces the infrastructural requirements, roughly about 50%. And the idea is that we will have that in place so it's a bit more attractive and easier for traditional farmers to get into the space. That will be coupled with a mother farm concept. So we'll, we will be pairing the traditional farmers with licensed producers um, and then the licensed producers will buy that, that ganja from, from, from the traditional farmer at an agreed cost. The licensed producer is also responsible for ensuring the farmer is growing to the, to the industry standards because that's very, very important. We have great traditional farmers, but there are some small differences in, in how you grow for the, for the regulated in, in industry. So that would need to be employed as well. So now once we have that in place, we need to be, be able to create the demand. And what will create that demand is the cannabis value added products, which I made mention earlier, um, which is why it's so important for us to have that nutraceutical bill um, that allows um, licensed producers that allows persons with a processing license to create these value-added pro products. We have processing plants in Jamaica that have GMP standards and EU GMP standards. I firmly believe that if we can get this nutraceutical bill in place, you'll see more persons taking the necessary steps to have their facility EU GMP certified so we can continue exporting to, to countries like Germany because we have been I'm proud to say that we do have uh, a company that has exported to Germany several times before. They've also exported to Australia. So things are in place. The industry is making small steps. But the, the opportunities provided for traditional farmers and being able to create that nutraceutical bill so we can expand the industry, I see them as in interconnected because they complement each other. Right. And... and we see that yeah putting such regulations can be you know progressive from a practical point of view but what what we have seen is the focus has been consistently on the startup and the focus has not been on the operational side of inclusion of these farmers and how we we incentivize their how we incentivize their you know, participation to remain within within the value chain because we must not fool ourselves that the black market is out there and is very lucrative and it has a sophisticated value chain that supports trade trade and commerce and there are a risk associated with you know participating in both value chains 
So how do we encapsulate that incentive to, to keep these farmers within that regulated market to you know, participate? There, there needs to be more understanding of the requirements, the capabilities of these farmers' willingness to actually participate. For example, any cannabis farmer who cultivates cannabis in the past knows that selling that selling his cannabis as wet weight does not possess the sort of economic value versus doing the post harvest work and selling it as a dry product so understanding so 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 what we have seen to is the persons who tend to draft these policies and regulate these and write these regulations do not necessarily have a full understanding of what takes place in the field, what what takes place within the brain of these traditional farmers and how do they see themselves participating. So equipping those farmers with some more human, you know, human resource capabilities to understand their value in terms of Applying the trade from a cultivator to a trimmer to a you know processor. So it's key that that all stakeholders come 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 on the table to understand this perspective from a, a common ground perspective. And we have seen where Jamaica has granted 100 licenses so far. And we have possibly like 40 odd dispensaries so far, but still when you visit these dispensaries, you do not see the level of activity, the level of commercial activity that will be sustainable to generate this sort of commerce locally. And we need to see more of that happening. And as Mr. Finn said that in order to facilitate commerce it takes more than just policing and enforcement as one of my colleagues said dr knife regulations and enforcement definitely stifles commerce and an ability to be creative right jamaica has a brand equity associated with you know cannabis cannabis is an indicator species for this country so how do we now encapsulate that value and market it and produce value added products that would have international reach and international value like it is said that developing a medical industry yes but if you jamaica depends heavily on in you know, tourism right if uh person is using cannabis in the developed world such as canada united states germany for medical reasons and you are visiting jamaica most chances are you want to travel with with your medicine that has been approved and so on in your in your jurisdiction but a tourist will be willing to patronize cannabis use based on that experiential being within the tropics. So understanding why persons want to use cannabis, so on, we need to understand and associate that with the value that can be created and surrounded around that experience. Yeah, I have to be honest, I don't really understand the thought behind differentiation between medical and recreational to be honest because from my perspective i see two persons both consume common cannabis both feel better afterwards subjectively <clears throat> and the one gets thrown in jail because he said well you weren't sick enough before and for the other person it's okay so that really doesn't make sense to me i would absolutely agree with you here that we have to find a way to to um yeah, to, to access both of these um, markets from a strategic perspective. But you said something very interesting, and I want to expand on that, on the brand value on the one hand with, with the Jamaica. Um, 
but also from a cultivator standpoint, because I would say um, Germany is relatively cold and not so sunny compared to Jamaica. No. So, um, and I know that you did some research here, like how, because I'm thinking, isn't it way cheaper to grow um, cannabis in Jamaica where you don't have to supplement with um, artificial light compared to, uh, let's say, Europe or Canada or something, and therefore you also would have a competitive yeah. and economic advantage? Is that correct? Yes, from and, and we have seen where that has been a global move where we see some of the poorer countries globally like Lesotho, Zambia, they have relaxed legislation in the aim to attract foreign direct investment to their shores and it has been very similar within the Jamaican context and what we have seen what we will see is as the world becomes more liberal based on you know cannabis legislation uh, we will see production being pushed more towards the equatorial region where land is going to be cheaper water availability uh, land labor and mm -hmm. utilizing the solar radiation which will reduce the cost of you know production significantly so so it uh, the onus is is on these you know countries to get themselves ready to understand exploiting cannabis production from a commercial standpoint with proper standards in place to meet public health and safety and maintain environmental stewardship by cultivating and producing cannabis biomass. Right. So you would also agree that Jamaica has really a location or geographical advantage in Yes, even you've cannabis. seen a with just within the Caribbean archipelago where Jamaica has a significant advantage compared to the other regional jurisdictions in the fact that Jamaica is considered the only true Caribbean island in the essence that the entire Caribbean, the entire island is surrounded by the Caribbean Sea. The other countries have the Atlantic on one side versus Caribbean Sea, and this brings a different climate. We, we have even seen locally within the Jamaican context where the traditional cultivating regions has always been more situated on the south coast, which gets significantly less rainfall compared to the north coast. So understanding your biogeographical demographics in exploiting cannabis. Cannabis is a drought-tolerant plant by uh, producing more resinous material when it's flowing. So understanding when, when should you cultivate, understanding how do you cultivate and the sort of germ, the sort of germplasm that will give you commercial biomass by using less inputs and less energy costs. We need to enhance that research and fund more, more research to understand that where we have also seen that coming out of St. Vincent, we have seen where the data collected from seizures have, you know, suggested that the contribution and value of, you know, cannabis production outweighs banana production in the 1980s. Wow, okay, I didn't know that. All right, let's jump into some um, questions because they're piling up here and I want to make sure I don't miss anybody um here we go um i think i hope maybe some of the questions are already answered nonetheless i want to pull them up, up. what are the thoughts of a two-year moratorium be proposed to allow for traditional and even new growers to get up to spec to be able to trade commercially in the medical and the national markets i think levon that's probably your forte Yes, some elements of this is included in the special cultivators permit I made mention of earlier. So once a traditional farmer receives that 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 per, receives that permit, sorry, once I just realized my, my battery is about to die, <laughs> so I made this point and then and then charge up. Uh, so a part of that agreement for the for the cultivators permit is that 
we're giving the traditional farmers two and a half years, 30 months, to get um, all the things in place to, to be able to get that tier one cultivation license. So that cultivator's permits can also be seen as sort of a, a grooming period where they've been introduced to the industry. They get to understand how the regulated industry operates, and then they have up to two and a half years to get all their things in place um, to, to be able to, to have a cultivation license. Okay, perfect. Let's jump to the next question from Douglas Jordan. How would you rate the performance of the CLA as a facilitator to the existing local producers and investors working with the existing rules and regulations? Beyond looking at future legislative amendments, what is being done to moderate some of the complaints around punitive and subjective application of those rules regulations? I think you touched on that already a little early on, but do you want to add? Yeah, anything? sure. I'll add to it. Thanks for the question, question, Douglas. Over the past year and a half, we've made significant, significant changes, Douglas, in how we communicate with licensees and, and the allowances um, that, that, that we provide. Um, it still can be improved because just given the reality of our industry, um, given the reality of where we are, given the reality of, of the licensees and, and them needing better support in order to ensure that they survive in this industry, we have been making some, 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 some good allowances. It's something that can be improved and it's something that I keep at the forefront of my mind every time. Um, of course, recognize that there are board of directors and each director of that board has their own opinion about the regulations and how the industry um, should be regulated or should be managed. Um, so that is an, an ongoing process of of striking that ideal balance between being facilitator while ensuring that we are observing the regulations. All right, and as far as I can see, Roderick Gordon is agreeing. And of course, things can always, we all wish that things would go faster, but um, yeah, sometimes we have to be patient, um, but I think everybody here listening, um, yeah, is working on making progress. So I think Levon is recharging his phone. Um, let me go through one of the other questions that we have here. And um, Michelle, if you want to add anything, feel free to jump in at any time. Um, yeah, I think that's a good question from Robert Moore. Um, how do you get um, Mr. You. Robert, but from a cultivator perspective, it, it would not be GMP. GMP good manufacturer practices, that's for more your processing plant. For your production facility, it's going to be GACP, good agricultural and in your collection practices. And that takes a lot of operational procedures. It takes the development of standard operating procedures, uh, facilitate training of your staff. You need to have certain staff amenities in place and then you invite uh, your auditors to uh, provide an inspection and then they will make the recommendation if you are compliant based on GACP compliance. Do you have a ballpark from your experience what kind of financial investment that would be to yeah, fulfill all these requirements? Uh, so far, it has been sort of challenging to understand what the sort of financial cost is because uh, you have local bodies that facilitate local audits. But in terms of being Jamaican, not being a member of, I can't remember how the actual grouping, but the fact that an international auditor must come to the local shores to provide that level of auditing. So in terms of those, those sort of services that needs to be facilitated to generate the sort of economic commerce necessary, we need to see more being done from a public-private sector partnership to, to enhance these sort of requirements such as services for GMP, such as testing requirements to validate products, to understand certain inputs and residual levels, uh, microbial content, 
so forth. So we need to see those sort of infrastructural developments and servicing being affordable and being available to service other industry from an operating perspective. Okay, anything to add from your side, Levon, regarding the GMP certification? Uh, certification? Um, no, I think uh, Dr. Emmanuel said it well. Perfect. Then yeah, and, and it's very difficult because in order for you to facilitate international trade, compliance of these GMP and GACP standards are very rigid. And this is where the capacity and training and you know, certification really, really comes in to develop the human the human resource competence locally to be able to facilitate that 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 like level of quality assurance throughout the value chain of you know cannabis right let's talk a little bit about another aspect um which i hear primarily um from the u.s market from henry mckenzie Access to banking and finance is essential to any industry's growth, which is restricted due to the correspondence banking from the USA. Because we all know on a federal level, it's still illegal in the US. Without readily easy access to the capital, I don't think most traditional farmers will be able to develop their businesses. What alternatives are in the works to improve access to banking for all industry stakeholders? complicated but important question. Can you say anything about that? Uh, thanks for the question, Andre. Um, I, I, I wish I had a response for this that was encouraging and that makes sense, but unfortunately, unfortunately I do not. Um, and I don't because with the current status, uh, illegal status of, status of cannabis at the federal level in the U.S. And as Andre alluded to the corresponding banking issue, um, based on conversations we've had with local, with the banking sector in Jamaica, no one is, is willing to, to touch it or be a part of the industry in, in, in any way, given the corresponding banking issues and not wanting to, to lose their banking license or get into any issues. Um, Outside of that, I'd certainly love to throw back the question to the, uh, to, to the guests, to the participants. If there is a solution, based on your understanding of Jamaica's financial sector, if there's a solution out there, I'm certainly open to it. Uh, this is a question that comes up. And it's kind of it's hard to accept that our, our fate, in some ways, is, is tied to when the U.S. decides to legalize or not. Um, legalize cannabis at, at the federal level. Federal level. I'm very much open to understanding what we can do independently, and if that solution is out there, I'd love to know what it is. Yes, and if I may just add something, like because banks can can outright fund and and are not provide the sort of startup capital that's needed to fund. Uh, legal cannabis business with the sort of security infrastructure, the sort of fencing requirements, the sort of operational course that's needed if you want to get to, you know, commerce. And what we have seen is so because of that, we have seen the foreign direct investment model has been mainstay. And, and within, within the Jamaican context, that has really uh, not allowed for the for the inclusion of the traditional farmer because they were not they are not able and were not able to forge these sort of partnerships with the foreign investor companies to uh, uh, develop cannabis commerce so what we have seen is research has definitely pointed out that are uh, the partnerships within because Jamaica laws also states that in order to operate a cannabis business, 51% ownership must be local or locally owned. And because of that, we have seen where the upper to higher middle class people have been able to forge 
these sort of partnerships where are the background or the knowledge of operating agriculture businesses from a cannabis point of view has not been basically have experience doing so. So we have seen that the leverage that has been taken on our traditional and our cultural inheritance has been sort of very much subdued because of local banks not being able to provide that sort of startup capital where local participants could forge partnerships from a cooperative standpoint, from a more local local production or locally owned businesses. Yeah, and maybe I can add one or two sentences to that because as some of you know, I have a finance um, background and as far as I can tell, we have basically two problems here. One is for sure that a lot of the banking goes through the US with the federal um, situation still illegal. Um, but that's one side, but then the other side that basically the banks in Jamaica are yeah, lacking the, the, the necessary infrastructure to connect basically to the international um, financial payment system, which are because they, at least of the viewpoint from the um, regulationary bodies, do not fulfill their money, money laundering and um, so forth um, requirements, which of course comes from the whole um, drug trade and so on. So I think it's a very complicated topic. And as um, yeah, Levon said, I'm not sure how yeah, Jamaica itself can can solve that problem because it's yeah on so many on so many levels. Yeah, um, I think I think sorry. what what we've also seen is that a lot of given this uh, financial predicament for the cannabis industry, what you see in a lot of persons doing is forming forming linkages with family members or, or, or close friends and pooling their funds together because of the lack of the ability to get a, a loan um, from, from, uh, from the bank. And that's very interesting because that sort of ties back to that very communal theme of, of, about ganja in the first place, where it's a, it's a community and people right. um, coming together. So that has been one approach I've seen people taking locally. Yeah, I think. Um... Yeah, and and we have also seen where the large diaspora interest in seeing the promulgation of the industry reach international shores has been so far has a lot of enthusiasm and a, a lot of interest, and many of these partnerships that have been formed have had a lot of diaspora influence in terms of in terms of supporting business commerce startup capital and so forth so so they so uh, the diaspora interest is definitely there to sort of want to see and facilitate the sort of international commerce that that can actually happen from you know jamaica but we also need to be very careful based on how do we capture that brand equity from from a value perspective, because I have seen where instances where certain foreign direct investor companies, they bring a turnkey greenhouse, they bring the grower from Canada or wherever they, their interest is to land a plane with 2000 clones, they import a container of soil, and then the aim is to export it to the international shores and market it as you know Jamaican grown. But how much really does that contribute towards, you know, Jamaica? And we all know if you go to Germany, Canada, any first world country and you visit a dispensary and you see Jamaican grown, you will definitely at least want to patronize that, that you know, product in some way. So uh, the brand equity is there, but, but more needs to be done to understand the geographical indicators, the sort of inputs to really facilitate that sort of local injection into the economy. Yeah, absolutely. I think there has to be some framework that ensures that when there's the label Jamaica on the product that it's actually 
grown there and the local community or whatever criteria you want to use um, benefited from that. I think there, it's always very hard to kind of, you know, have a, a certification or something that actually makes sense. And then you can trace and it's transparent, like fair trade or things like that. But um, I would absolutely agree with you. Um, yeah, that we have to make sure, as you said, that the brand um, and uh, everything behind it um, actually stays in the country and doesn't just get exported in other countries or other companies benefit from it. And um, yeah, that probably ties in with the comment from Roderick here. Um, the issue is how we were able to exempt use without full recreational use. It is a complex socioeconomic issue. And um, yeah, absolutely. I think that's kind of the problem that we see in Jamaica right now, that um, the recreational market isn't really accessible. Um, we talked about that earlier, that yeah. with the tourists and so on. And um, yeah, Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, and, and if I may actually comment on that, what we have seen from doing research based on what the recreational market, so, so because the medical market pretty much denies access, right? And so the average Jamaican who uses cannabis persuasively throughout his daily lifestyle is very likely to want to patronize purchasing cannabis from a, from a, from a dispensary point of view because the price, the access, you need a medical certificate and so on. So we don't see the level of commerce taking place within these local dispensaries. But what we have seen is the players who existed prior to decriminalization, who have established cultural herb ends or chalice stations for a sort of word, which which is a sort of cultural norm in various communities throughout, you know, throughout, you know, Jamaica. And with that, because the laws have been relaxed, the enforcement on these establishments has not been as harsh as prior to, as prior to decriminalization. And, and what has happened is these, these herb spots or these distribution points that existed locally they provide the sort of access to the local to the local person that other dispensary does not necessarily provide and the purchase point and the packaging quantities from high quality to medium quality to a sort of lower quality cannabis is available from these traditional herb and so 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 they are meeting the socio-economic and cultural norms of the typical Jamaican cannabis user. So, so, so they are able to encapsulate or infringe on the sort of commercial activity that would that we would want to see from a sustainable point of view taking place within the more regulated market. Right. Anything to add, Yvonne, from your side? Um, no, that's a just a, that's an interesting point, uh, Doctor Emmanuel makes because it sounds like what Doctor Emmanuel is saying is that the the decriminalization or the regulated industry has actually empowered <laughs> the illicit industry in terms of in terms of 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 the quality of cannabis that's being produced. And, and like you said, the accessibility, which is, which, is, which, is, which is a key thing. So, for example, one of the things we've been trying to imp implement, especially during the heights of COVID, was to set up, uh, to allow dispensaries to do delivery. And we went through this very long and onerous process of, of trying to figure out how we can make it work within the regulations and dealing with a lot of pushback from several sectors, um, several sections of the sector. So now we're at a point where the herb houses cannot offer delivery. But that is, from what I understand, in the illicit market, that's one of the key um, uh, advantages. advantages that they have, yes. that someone can call them and they, they can have it delivered. So 
this ties back to the point I made earlier about we have to find ways to make the regulations work for us. The regulations is, doesn't need to be a static thing on a piece of paper and then we'll follow it to a T. That makes absolutely no sense. We have to have a culture and a mindset where we're making the regulations work for Jamaica and Jamaicans. If we're not achieving that, then we're not, we're, we're, we're not fulfilling our job to, to, to the fullest. And that's something that I, I, I carry with me every day. I need to find a way to get the regulations working for us, for it to be practical, for persons to feel the benefits of the regulations. We've made some small wins, but there's a lot more to be done. And that's, that's, what, that's what drives me and that's what drives the book, finding ways to make it work, even within all the different challenges uh, and, and battles that we have to fight. Yeah, I think that's we are here and I would absolutely agree. And maybe we can use the last 20 minutes to get a little practical here because um, I think the overarching vibe that I get is that we made a great step with the decriminalization and the, the medical market that we have, but that's only very small part of the accessible market for the traditional um, Jamaican farmer. Um, if you don't have a lot of money, you have to go all through the international certifications and export internationally and um, so on. So first of all, everybody um, watching, listening um, live right now, put all your questions in the chat now, put question before that because we are yeah, running out of time otherwise and um, I want to get all the questions in. Um, that being said, um, the first one um, comes from Robert again. Um, where can one go to initiate the process of certification? So what would be the first starting point? I'm a farmer. Um, I want to grow cannabis, um, maybe. Uh, yeah. And where should I where should I start? What would be your recommendation to get the first information, get the certification and think about how can I actually turn that into a legal and viable business model? All right. So yeah. good. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say a good starting point um, from the regu regulatory standpoint is to, is to start at the CLA website, cla.org.gm. Um, it has all the basic information in terms of what's required for the different licenses. You can also download the application, application forms there. So just as a starting point, just to whet your appetite and to, to build your knowledge base and your awareness of what is required, uh, that's a good starting point. Yeah, uh, so yes, yeah, so in terms of GACP cert certification, yeah, you would definitely fir first of all need to understand what is the requirements for GACP. So there are many documents that that exist from EU GMP, uh, locally from the Bureau of Standards. We develop three technical standards from production and processing and packaging and labeling it will be good to also start there to familiarize yourself with the sort of operational and standard and and sort of procedures that are necessary the sort of documentation that is necessary to understand what a gacp is and in order for you to facilitate the audit you must have the level of standard operating procedures in place it's around 148 SOPs from cultivate from technical cultivation SOPs to sanitation to how you manage your staff and your HR competence, level of record keeping and, and documentation, the level of legal of legal documents that should be in place from the CLA cultivators license to water testing to environmental monitoring documents from NEPA and so on would be necessary in order to facilitate a comprehensive audit where you will be most likely be able to pass and facilitate international trade. So it's a very tedious process. Uh, this is That's why I mentioned earlier that the sort of consultation services is going to be necessary to enhance the sort of the sort of capabilities that would be necessary to meet the sort of criteria that would be needed to facilitate GACP certification. All right. So I think that was answered in depth. 
And that gives me or brings me to the next, not really question, but I think it's a good point to mention here because at the end of the day, um, yeah, I think we all benefit from talking to each other and the community and building a network. So yeah, gan ganjaconference.com um, next month. If I read that correctly, everybody feel free to check out yeah, the website. Mind. Support Mr. Jackson. I definitely support his his move. You know, he has been working very hard behind the scenes to make his his event you know success. So if you have time or so, please visit the website and you know try to patronize Mr. Jackson's exerted efforts to really put the cannabis industry on the forefront. Yeah, feel free to send me an invite for more information. I'm more than happy to spread the word, Mr. Jackson. Um, next one, uh, I don't know if that's a question or a comment from Douglas again. One of the biggest challenges is the marketing to the non-traditional customer. Yeah, agree. The industry needs a collective marketing and educational message to get people past their fear or anxiety or discomfort of entering a dispensary and hearing about product from a young but tender. <laughs> that's, that's absolutely correct. Um, I think from my personal point of view, um, yeah, the anti or the war on drugs and the propaganda that um, we heard over the last decades um, made or resulted in that, that people are misinformed, people have a lot of fear. And um, yeah, um, and I think the only thing that we can do here is to educate people, to talk about it, to remove the stigma. And the first thing is, of course, to decriminalize it, to make people aware, hey, um, nobody has died from smoking a joint yet, but probably it's um, removed a lot of suffering, as far as I can tell from the research. Yes, Mr. Yes, Mr. Gordon, this is a very interesting point because the war on drugs have drive a lot of fear, especially into the old, the older generation, like people like at my parents age right and they have a, a level of resentment in visiting these 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 herb these herb dispensary points where the information that is being you know communicated is not sound and it is not really communicated from a professional a professional point of view we all know that there is still a lot there is still a high level of ambiguity surrounding administering of, of, of medical cannabis. So the educational drive where we have seen was written in the laws where an educational drive has to take place to educate the population a lot more based on cannabis usage, based on the benefits, the dangers of using cannabis. And we have not really seen that level of public education taking place within the schools, within the university, and within the general context of, you know, Jamaica. And we have also noted that uh, understanding and educating the population is going to empower the uh, knowledge and empower the value that could be uh, generated from administering cannabis commercially. And, and it is important to note that the regulation and laws have not really looked and focused on, on, on bylaws and regulations surrounding advertising and what can be said and what can't be said in marketing in marketing cannabis products. Also, we need to start from the Dangerous Drug Act, like having a law that's, that speaks about a dangerous drug, but we are trying to facilitate a medical in industry also tends to send the wrong message to the wider population. So uh, creating a sort of medical cannabis industry bill or an in industry bill surrounding cannabis is going to be key to destigmatize what cannabis is and what cannabis can do. Uh, great point, Michelle. One of the, 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 the first things I proposed um, when I became chairman is that we need to have a Cannabis Industry Development Act and not a Dangerous Drug Act. 
Um, suffice it to, to say that is, since I've been a part of government, I have to learn that if you're going to achieve anything, you need baby steps. And proposing a Cannabis Industry Development Act was seen as a, a giant leap <laughs> by many persons. So we're taking a step back. We, 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 we're doing baby steps. So great question, Douglas, about the, the educational aspect just this week. Uh, I met with the I met with the the management team and some of the board of directors, and we were talking just about that the, the marketing and the communication of the of the authority, and and it is significantly important and well needed, as as mentioned, to to counter the the the, the propaganda campaign over the last the last hundred years. Um, some of the things that we've been doing from the CLA standpoint to address that is one, we've been having more stake, stakeholder engagement with groups such as the Medical Council of Jamaica, um, with the Pharmaceutical Society of Jamaica. It's important to understand where these, are, where these groups and these persons are in their mindset uh, so we can address it accordingly. So, for example, when we had that meeting with the doctors, I'd say the majority of them want to be a part of the industry. They would like to get to a place where they can prescribe medicine, but they acknowledge that they first acknowledge their ignorance, meaning they don't know enough about cannabis just as a plant, as a commodity, and they don't, they don't know enough about the medicinal applications. So some high-level doctor training is needed. One of the other things we also spoke about is the need to to introduce cannabis education in, in the medical school at the university. And that's something that was, uh, that was welcomed. Um, we now have to look at what are the steps to, to, to get that program, program implemented, specifically for the medical, me medical students. Um, and we've also recently, the CLA acquired the services of a, a PR agency who has a specific responsibility of helping us with our public communication and our, our public engagement. A portion of the funds from the CLA, as Dr. Emmanuel alluded to, is required to go towards public education. That fund, fund, those monies actually go to the National Council on Drug Abuse. Um, and so, for example, they had a campaign recently called Good Ganja Sense, um, which is their way of, of communicating to young people that they need to leave ganja alone until they're an, an, an adult, and that is not suitable for a teenager. What we need now to complement that is a much, a much broader national campaign. It needs to be done at a national level. So pretty much how um, some agricultural products or tourism is re received, receives a national focus in terms of education and communication, that's what's required for the cannabis industry. So we need to get to a place where we can have a, in schools, essay, essay competition is a big thing in, in primary schools and high schools in Jamaica. We need to get to a place where we can have an essay competition about the medicinal benefits of cannabis and, and, and getting students to a place where, where it's not being approached as a drug, it's not being approached as something that's going to make it crazy, it's not being approached as something that's illegal, it's simply being approached as a plant, no different from mint or rosemary that has medicinal benefits. And the task for them is to explore these medicinal benefits and write, and, and write about it. Um, so there are different layers and different ways of how we can approach that public education. And small steps are being taken. But again, like I said, since I've been a part of government, I, I, I've learned to appreciate the, the value of, of small steps and, and small wins. They train you in patience, huh? <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. So let's get to some of the last questions we have here. And again, if you have a question, um, now is really um, the last time to put it in. Um, afterward, um, after, otherwise, I fear we wouldn't. Uh, we won't get to them. So Roderick is asking: um, Will the amended regulations and export regulations be passed in two thousand twenty-two? Roderick, to that? <laughs> Roderick I've, 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 I will desist from putting a, a timer on the regulations. When I first was appointed chairman in February, I believe 
around that period or a few months after I made the statement that the export regulations will be gazetted very, very soon. It's been over a year, still has not been done. From the CLA side and the ministry side, we have done our part. It is now with the chief parliamentary council for it to be gazetted. But as I'm sure you're quite aware, that department of the government is, is overwhelmed, like many other sectors of government. So we continue to follow up, we continue to lobby, we continue to, to push the importance of having this, this law in place. Because from what I understand from an investor standpoint, they, they have much more confidence when, when an export law is in place and gazetted versus just an export-import permit, which is what we have now. The exports are still being allowed. We've exported to over 10 countries, um, over 100 different export permits. Um, but but so, so, so that is the, the absence of the regulation has not stopped us from exporting and importing. But we do want to get to a place where the export is, is gazet export regulation is gazetted and finalized. All right. Yeah, fantastic dialogue this morning. I couldn't agree more. Very Thank knowledgeable you, guest today. And of course, support Amari and ganjaactivist.com. Yes, and yes. ganjaconference.com. That's the <laughs> marketing over here. And uh, yeah, I think uh, I can only agree with Roderick here um, that we all support um, the chairman and, um, of course, um, the doctor with your work, um, even if there are small steps, and um, I think they are very important. So yeah, let you. me go through. Oh, I think we went through all the questions. By now, there are a lot of more comments, but I think we answered all the points so far. Um, yeah, anything to add from you, gentlemen? Um, anything that I forget to ask or to touch on? I think we have a few more minutes left, so feel free. Yeah, what add. I would just like to add is like, as more regional governments get on board and want to engage cannabis commerce from a legal a legal point of view there are lessons to be learned from the jamaica model based on what what has taken place where we are and where we plan to go here we have seen where one of the major setbacks is yes we amend the dangerous drug act that sort of facilitates the development of a regulatory authority, but cannabis being an interdisciplinary approach to understanding commerce from the legal point of view, from the scientific point of view, from an agricultural point of view, from a social, a social point of view, we need to, we need to amend the various laws, the various agencies, the various departments that could support the forward, backward, and cross linkages to make the industry more commercially viable. All right. Yes. And, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, totally agree with with Doctor Doctor Emmanuel. You know, you know, I'm 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 very passionate about the cannabis industry, and there's nothing more I want. There's nothing more I want than for Jamaica to have a successful cannabis industry, primarily because we deserve it. Dr. Emmanuel alluded to the brand equity that Jamaica has. No other country can compete with Jamaica on that. We have a strong tourism product. Wellness tourism is booming right across the world. Cannabis and tourism is a natural link. We have reggae music, which is loved all across the world, which is one of the main reasons uh, why we have such a strong brand equity through reggae music and through Rastafari. Those are two key elements of our culture that as, at a governmental level, we need to stop fooling around and we need to maximize it. We need to focus on it. We need to figure it out. And the only way we're going to do it, as Dr. Emmanuel said, is through collaboration. Collaboration with the different ministries, the Ministry of Health and Wellness, is a key, key stakeholder for this entire industry. And 
we continue to lobby them for for more urgency and more support in addressing some of these matters. There are simply some things that we cannot proceed with without the full participation and buying from the Ministry of Health and Wellness. And that is significant and must never be underestimated or understated. Uh, the Ministry of Tourism uh, as, as well. There's a key opportunity, opportunity there, there for us. You know, most Caribbean countries can benefit from an improved GDP. Most Caribbean economies need that support, especially coming out of, out of COVID. Cannabis industry provides that opportunity, but it needs focus, it needs intention, and it requires a, a, a strategic outlook on the industry, not just amending a, regu a regulation and setting up a regulatory body. That is, that is, that is just the first step of many steps. We need to develop this, this strategic outlook at the CLA level. That's what we've done. We've developed a strategic outlook. It did not exist before uh, this new board was appointed. And it's now an ongoing process of feeding all the different stakeholders into that strategic outlook. You know, you know like when you're watching a, 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 a sci-fi movie and you can almost sort of, if I could transplant my, my vision and my thought process into the minds of the key stakeholders, we would have a, 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 a functional and, and an industry on the path to success in a very, very short time. Because for me, the solutions and the opportunities, they're so obvious. They're so clear. It's right there in front of us. But we need greater stakeholder engagement, greater buying and greater belief to make this in, in, in industry work. And I'm, I'm, here, I'm here for it. I'm here for the fight. I'm here for the battle. Um, because we deserve it and the people of Jamaica deserve this opportunity. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And um, yeah, that being said, I want to wrap up this live stream. If you're still with us, live here with us, or if you're watching the replay and if you found that helpful so far, um, do me a favor, hit the like button, share it with anybody you think uh, might benefit from that content and should know what we talked about here today. Feel free to head over to the YouTube channel, subscribe there for more content like that. And of course, um, yeah, reach out to my two guests, connect with them, um, ask them more questions. Um, they're usually very open to help where they can. Um, but where would you prefer or how can people get in contact with you gentlemen if they have any questions or if you yeah if they want to reach out to you go ahead levon yeah sure um email is always best so levon flynn at gmail.com l-e-v-a-u-g-h-n-f-l-y-n-n -N -N, at gmail.com uh yes uh Email is always better. Uh, you can visit the University of the West Indies, the Faculty of Science and you know, Technology, and you will find my name. You will see my email department. I'm normally willing to meet with persons. I'm available. I try to make myself available for those who use social media. You could put my first name and last name, and you could follow my uh, research, my publications, and so forth perfect that being said yeah feel free to connect with each and every one of us um feel free to reach out on linkedin connect with me there and of course i'm more than happy to put you in contact um with everybody else that being said um yeah thanks everybody for tuning in today i hope it was helpful and i hope to see you next time have a good one bye bye all right. And thanks to you as well, Simon. Thanks for the interest in Jamaica's cannabis industry. And thanks for facilitating this discussion. More than welcome. Thanks. Your for audience. Being Special thanks to you all, you know. Yeah. Been yeah. a pleasure. Okay. Very informative um, and enhancing discussions. Yeah, I think together we can do and achieve something here. All right, have a good one, a great start in the day, or if you're watching this as a replay, great day, night, whatever. Talk soon, later, bye-bye.